Here I hear yet. All right, so I'm going to record one moment. I started it, it's recording. Record in this computer. Hi, Miriam, it's recording. I've got All right, it. so, oh, okay. Thank you, Gary, you're recording now. Yeah. All right, so let's, um, let's talk about, uh, you know, the care approach when you are talking to someone who is saying, well, I'm going to die or someone who has suicidal thoughts. The care a model is just uh, stands for C is for calm and connect. So you can say something like, I am here, talk to me and always remain calm. So there is no reason for you to panic. Uh, sometimes, you know, we feel that we don't have that enough training or maybe we feel uh, not so much confident about what to say. But uh, the important thing is to think we are humans. We just, this person only needs to be heard or this person only needs to be connected to someone, right? Uh, a will stand for active listening and assessment. So I want to hear you. I want to be here for you. R is for referral. So you're gonna say help is available. So you're gonna actually with this word, you're gonna increase their hope. You're gonna tell them, you know, other people have experienced the same as you and let's see what we can do. Let's see where we can find answers. Well, let's see where we can find, a, you know, places, persons that can help you in those dark moments. As you hear in those videos where the Ashley story, when she was describing her situation, she mentioned about feeling into a, being into a dark tunnel and also the heaviness in her, in her shoulders, in her back, right? So the person actually have also some body, you know, feelings. So just by listening to what, how they feel and, and also have empathy, which is the E. So E will be for empathy, you know. Uh, I recommend you to, to read some of the material from Brené Brown about empathy. If you feel that you need to, uh, you know, improve that area for your counseling. But again, you know, you don't need to be trained or fully trained to assist people uh, in distress. Uh, there is a documentary, we're not gonna watch it because I'm aware of the time. We have a few, half and 35 minutes, but uh, you can actually look into this uh, documentary. It's called The S World. And um, later on at, in your home, you can watch this uh, documentary where the filmer, uh, she was looking for people who have experienced suicidality and who had a attempt suicide. And uh, she interviewed them and uh, it's very interesting, you, sh you should watch it. Let's talk about some protective factors. So if the person has strong connections to family and community supports, uh, if the family, if she has or he has skills in problem solving, coping and conflict resolutions, sense of belonging, sense of identity and good self-esteem, cultural, spiritual and religious connections and beliefs, identification of future goals, constructive use of leisure time, enjoyable activities, support through ongoing medical and mental health care relationships, effective clinical care for mental, physical, and substance use disorders, easy access to a variety of clinical intervention and support for help seeking, restricted access to highly me little metal means of suicide. So these protective factors can be a good source when you are writing your safety plan or when you are providing counseling, 
the goals for therapy could be uh, supporting them in in resolving or or problem solving, uh, supporting them to make connections with family or community. Also, advocacy. Uh, on those times, people tend to not have that uh, motivation to look for help. So you can be that advocate to connect your client with a community um, organizations that can help them, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So these protective factors could be used, as I say, when you're writing the safety plan with your client or when you are counseling. Now let's talk about safety plan. So this is very important. Um, <clears throat> when we run the assessment, we want to know, uh, you know, if, if, as I mentioned before, if there is a low risk or medium high risk, then uh, you will sit down with the client and talk about a recognizing early warning signs so that your client can recognize, help them to recognize if there is some, something physical, something that is happening, maybe when they feel really depressed, sad, uh, if there is any behavioral, if they are impulsive. I, I remember a client who not, not too, uh, you know, too long ago, it's just recently, that he mentioned when I was doing the suicide risk assessment, he was mentioning that um, every time when he walks from work to his house, there is a bridge and he always wanted to jump out of the bridge. So he was suicidal, suicidal ideation. So we were making the safety plan. And one of the things that we agreed on was that he actually would, should take another route going home uh, so that he can avoid that bridge. And um, yeah, he did it. He, he stopped walking somewhere else and avoiding the bridge and that really worked. So he was in the last report I heard from him is that he, the, you know, the, upon other things, of course, is that uh, he was not having suicidal ideation anymore and that he is doing okay. Uh, the other thing is the de-escalation and coping, a distraction, self-soothing, grounding on an individual basis. Uh, the three step of the safety plan is de-escalation and coping, people and places. The fourth, personal supports. The five, professional supports and six, creating a safer environment. So I really encourage you that when you are writing a safety plan, you should include all these six steps. So let's look at the early warning signs. Um, that could be thoughts, images, mood situations, behavior situation uh, that I am feeling distress. So you're trying to dig deeper. Right, so just don't don't stay with the first thing. Try to, to talk about more in depth, and then write down, as I say, with your client all those warning signs. Look for and discuss potential patterns. Uh, for example, I didn't think anything about forgetting my keys three times in a week. Now, when I think about it, it was a sign something was off. Right, so those are sort of like uh, finding those patterns. Uh, another, watching too much news. Uh, focus on internal coping strategies. Review what has worked on previous occasion. For example, uh, acquiring those or doing uh, breathing exercises, increasing activity, going out for walks things that will uh, improve their mental health and well-being. Iterate, it may not make you feel better. The goal is to keep as safe as possible and alive, right? So the goal is to keep them alive. 
rather than just make them feel better. Point out the fluidity of this section both asking for crisis de-escalation support from friends, family, and professional, sitting in silence, break things down, making lists, etc. In the de-escalation and coping, we actually gonna look for people or places that can provide distraction, support, self-soothing and grounding. Important to distinguish between the escalation strategies and support, emphasize boundaries, even when a person is not helpful and are part of our lives, they can play a role. For example, a mom that is not a good listener and she cleans really well, so invite her over to help me clean all of the kitchen cupboards. Things I can do to take my mind off my problems without contacting another person. For example, relaxation technique, physical activity, off leash dog park, that path, my house that goes out to the beach, uh, just being in public places. The escalation and COVID uh, people and places. Discuss the process of how to have a conversation with someone the client wants on their list. Make sure the name and phone number is written on the plan. Discuss potential boundary issues. Use the conversation to educate participants on identifying what the needs are to keep safer and how to ask for those needs to be met. People and social settings that provide distractions, remind participants that changing people on this list is not unusual, given that needs change as we change. So they may be right, uh, I will call a friend, I will call my mother, I will call my aunt. So, but always have the number beside, or they will or, uh, also pay attention Pay attention to the body language. If it's possible, remove yourself from situations that trigger the feeling of dying. Personal support. Identify professional supports and indicate availability. So this is when uh, they cannot also, you can tell them you can call me if it's in the morning, but uh, always uh, be, a, you know, be mindful of uh, you don't gonna tell them, call me 24 seven, right? Uh, there are other professionals they can call the crisis line or, or et cetera, et cetera, right? People whom I can ask for help, share experiences, good or bad, emphasize the importance of identifying the need when accessing crisis line or warm lines. Discuss the limitation. Uh, so here are some numbers of uh, professional support and um, they can actually, if it's very high risk, of course, we're going to call 911. Now, number one, don't panic again. I will stretch that word of no panicking. If it's a very high risk, you're just going to tell your client, you know, I am concerned right now for your safety. So I have to call someone to help you. I need to call 911. Do you want an ambulance or police? So you actually have to talk to your client about his preferences, right? Don't just start, say, uh, you know, I'm concerned for you. I'm gonna call someone, you just stay there. And then the person is already in distress and is feeling suicidal and then you are also panicking and suddenly, you know, the police may come and the sirens and it's, it's all chaos. So it's always uh, asking them, uh, would you like them to come uh, perhaps to collect you in the back door of your home? Uh, you can also ask the ambulance not to, to use the siren so that uh, the person doesn't feel like, uh, oh, everybody's gonna know that 
the, the, the ambulance came for me, right? So all those small details, you can talk to your client and remain calm and, and wait for the, for the support to arrive. And then you can just, um, uh, at that point, just let them, the professionals take care of it. And of course you have to let know Gary or myself or your clinical supervisor that uh, you just have um, a high risk, uh, uh, you know, person that you support and you did a, a, in the form that a, I'm gonna show you at, uh, at the end of the form, you're gonna write down all the steps you took to support this individual. And uh, that's important. Um, here are other uh, numbers that that you can that the person can call if, for example, is just a medium risk or low risk. Also, provide these numbers in their safety plan. Uh, yeah, you can take a picture, and later on we can actually put those numbers in the, perhaps in the intake form where, where we have the emergency care numbers. Safer environment. So making the environment safe, for example, removing access to things that can harm you, identifying objects, sounds, textures, visualization, days that may enable the person to keep themselves safer. Removing oneself from environment when feeling unsafe or de-escalated. Pen and paper beside the bed. I made a safety box and made it visible and accessible. The red button, people I can contact immediately when I'm very stressed. The things that it's most important to me and makes me makes life worth living is identify obstacles that could get in the way of implementation, identify possibilities to overcome those obstacles, encourage clients to share plan with family and friends, encourage clients to keep a plan in an accessible place, right? Some people may just post their safety plan in the in the fridge, in the kitchen, or in their offices, easily to have to be accessible. Uh, if they work from home, for example, they can put it in their, you know, in their table. I don't know. So, so work with your client and find ways to keep their environment safe. Uh, if uh, there was a case where this woman have the, you know, those suicidal ideations, and she always was thinking with her pills because she has a bunch of pills for anxiety and what she did is actually when she was feeling suicidal you know she has those warning signs she put them down in the freezer so they were not too accessible for her so when she started having those thoughts she started digging in the freezer to get those pills and by the time she was able to reach them the suicidal ideation was gone. So uh, making that, uh, you know, those strategies can help the person, uh, you know, think, think twice. Uh, there is a documentary for uh, where they were interviewing people who actually survive when they jump off the, the bridge in San Francisco, the Golden Bridge. And actually all of them, uh, say that in the minute they jump, like the second they jump, they regret it. So that means that small frame of, of, of time, of window of time can really make a big difference, right? And remember, they don't really wanna die. They need help or they're looking for help or they're looking to stop the pain. Uh, these are things that you can talk to your client how to keep safe. So you're going to tell them, remember that thoughts of suicide are just thoughts. You don't have to act on them. These thoughts may only last a few minutes. You may feel differently in a few hours. 
delay any decisions to end your life, give yourself time to get the support you need, remove anything in the house that you may use to impulsively harm yourself, maybe give it to a friend, store crisis line phone numbers or web links in your mobile phone for easy use, avoid being alone, have someone near you until your thoughts of suicide decrease, avoid drugs and alcohol, they can intensify how you feel and make decisions making more impulsive. And so this is essential care practice. Um, I'm just gonna, we, we won't have time to go over all these essential care practice, but the most important thing is that when you're talking and you're providing support for someone who's suicidal, these general principles will be more important to take into consideration. So you got, again, you know, it's creating that environment that it, it opens communication. You're gonna involve the person when you're doing that uh, counseling or when you are doing the safety plan and just listening. I think your active listening skills will be very important and will come handy here. Uh, be friendly, respectful and not judgmental and also use good verbal communication skills, right? So we're not gonna go into deep into this as well, as I say, because we only have 15 minutes and I want to show you our suicidal risk assessment that we have at moving forward. Thank you very much. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop sharing my screen because I'm gonna open the document and I will show you the, the document um, that we're gonna use at moving forward for a uh, suicidal assessment, okay? Now let me open the document. Okay, so now, uh, one moment. Okay, so I'm gonna share, this is the document that we have, the site risk assessment. Um, so of course, we're gonna write down all this information. And this is a screen, when you are doing these questions or when you're asking these quest questions, remember to have uh, all this, uh, remember about the warm path, a, a, you know, approach, the care approach. A, remember the, what Dr. Uh, Klonsky, you know, the four areas that you have to be aware of. So you're gonna read through those questions. For example, have you attempted suicide in the past? Have you wish you were dead or wish you could go to sleep and not wake up? Have you had any thoughts of killing yourself? Do you have a plan so important, right? This is so important. We need to ask them if there is a plan. For example, if they say, well, yeah, I wanna kill, I wanna shut, you know, shut my, myself to die. And then, well, you can ask them, do you have a gun at home? No. Okay, so how are you planning to get that? gone if you plan it to shut yourself. I don't know, I just gonna walk in the streets, maybe someone can sell one to me. So if they answer uh, like that, of course, the plan is not really realistic. So therefore you start thinking, well, this is not a really high risk versus if the person says, yes, I do have a gun uh, because he's a police officer, for example. Right, so they do have access, they know how to use the gun. So that person is actually at high risk. How many times have you had these thoughts, right? Again, this why this is important? Well, if they have thoughts more often, then we have to be aware of that. If they say, well, I didn't have those thoughts last week, they just started this week, 
and they are happening three times every day, mostly in the mornings when I wake up or mostly when I come back from work because I'm lonely, there is no one at home, etc., etc. So all those things you have to take into consideration. When you have thoughts, how long do they last? Can you stop thinking about killing yourself or wanting to die if you want to? Do you recently experience loss of a dear one, severe illness, chronic phys or physical pain or other acute medical condition, significant life change event, for example, separation and divorce? And now this form, actually, when you do this form, it's a Word, Word uh, document. So you can actually type it and fill it. Uh, Storing your computers, but as soon as you send it or you put it on the on OWL, I will ask you please to, to delete it from your devices, okay? Just for confidentiality issue. Do you have access to seek? Well, let's continue reading the, the form. Do you have access or seek to have access to firearms, available pills, or other means? Uh, <clears throat> are you drinking or using more drugs than usual? Do you have a reason to leave? Do you have anxiety or recently experienced major depression episode? Are you unable to sleep or sleeping at all time? Do you feel trapped, like there is no way out? Do you have feelings of hopelessness? Do you have highly impulsive behavior? Have you recently withdrawn from friends, family, and community? Are you experiencing rage, uncontrolled anger, seeking revenge? Are you engaging in risk activities seemingly without thinking? Are you planning to give away possessions or seeking long-term care for pets? Are there things anyone or anything, for example, family, religion, pain of death, that stop you from wanting to die or acting on thoughts of committing suicide. Okay, so there are 70 questions. Now, out of that, uh, please uh, state if there is uh, any risk involving this client, even if it's medium risk, low or very high risk. So if there is any risk, you're gonna, actually say yes, there is, right? But then you can assess the risk. Is there, a, has been there any previous attempt? Is it just the ideation, the intent, or there is a plan? Remember with the, when the person just want to harm themselves, is this only the risk of harm? If the person usually or had had you know, harm themselves just to, to cope with pain and problems. If they have the ideation to the, for the NSSI. So you just write down here. And then you are just going to describe the risk here in this area, right? And please just check uh, what are the risk factors that you see based on the information you gather with your client. If there is a duty to report, well, uh, if you had to call 911, you have the duty to report. So you need to write down here, yes, and you're gonna remember, you're gonna let know Gary, myself, and you, or your super, a clinical supervisor, and you cannot tell us what you did, what are the actions you took, right? Um, if you inform someone else, let's say you needed to inform their parents, the client agreed for you to call the parents, so then you have to call them, potential victim, police, child welfare, et cetera, et cetera. And then it, it gather the information of the person you talked to, uh, Perhaps if they can give you the name, telephone, the ID number, for example, the police, et cetera, et cetera, that will be very helpful. Uh, now, the, in the measures to take, taken to reduce risk, 
uh, please outline your safety plan. Uh, you were if you if it's a if it's not a very high risk at that moment. Uh, work with your client to write down a safety plan, quick safety plan. You don't need to have, a, you know, to have one hour, two hours to, with your client to write down a safety plan. So write something so that the person has some support or know what to do in case of those suicidal ideation comes back. Um, and again, you know, there is numbers to call. We're going to add those that uh, I show you in the PowerPoint. And uh, yeah, that's all the hourly, our, our society risk uh, assessment form. It's easy to use, it's not difficult. And I think it covers all the areas that we talk about during our presentation. Now, I'm gonna stop sharing and I will, we're gonna stop recording and I'm gonna open, uh, you know, the, the time for everybody. If anybody,